Greetings and welcome to Fossil Fuels Lecture. So fossil fuels gets a bad rap sometimes and I'd like to kind of explain how these things form, why we have a finite resource where they're concerned and why they're not considered renewable energy and how they tie and link into our course. So some of the things that you should be learning as we're going through this lecture is what are the different types of fossil fuels? How do they geologically develop? That's an important aspect because all fossil fuels do come from prior life over geologic time. And then we're going to look at various types of coal, oil, and natural gas. And we're going to talk about some controversial issues related to fossil fuels and pros and cons of each type of fossil fuels. So what exactly is a fossil fuel? Well, it's any combustible organic material such as petroleum, coal, natural gas derived from remains of former life. That last part, derived from remains of former life, is the key because any type of fossil fuel has come from pre-existing life, whether it be dinosaurs, whether it be plants, whether it be small microscopic organisms, which I might add, things like diatoms and foraminifera account for a majority of what we have for oil and gas. Fossil fuels are used to burn old biotic material and created from the geologic past for energy. So we have kind of discovered as a human civilization that fossil fuels existed back in like the 1700s and we've been using them ever since, but uh, we didn't figure out kind of how to make electricity till later on. Where is the origin of fossil fuels and when did it occur? The where and the when is important because they're two very different things and they vary by the different types of fossil fuels that we may be talking about. Specific coal types, for example, anthracite, formed during the Pennsylvanian period. And anthracite is like some of our most clean burning, oldest, most effective, very uh, important and, and expensive, I might add, coal that we may have. And the Pennsylvanian period lasted from about 318 million to 299 million years ago. So how did we come up with all this coal from that time frame? A lot of North America, or portions of it, should I say, were in swamp-like conditions. So the swampy conditions, especially in the eastern part of our continent, produce these massive coal beds, of which some have been buried further underground for a longer period of time, which has allowed the stuff that makes coal burn ugly and create air pollution to kind of burn off. And so that allows it to burn cleaner. It has a higher BTU, which means it burns uh, and produces more heat, and it has less leftover waste to get rid of after you burn it. Younger coal, however, formed during Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras which accounts for from like 251 million years ago in the Triassic period up to current time. So certainly coal forms the same way in swamp conditions. So that would be a great test question because you're not going to find coal forming from a bunch of dead organisms per se. It's predominantly formed in swamps. I'm not saying you can't form it from dead organisms. I'm saying mainly plants are where you're going to find this because it's the decay of biotic material and it's a very distinctive environment that produces coal swamps equating to uh, coal layers. So this is a North American geologic time scale and I'm going to just kind of point out where the Pennsylvanian exists right in here and you can see it's part of what's called the Carboniferous and this is a real fancy geologic time scale, it has all the ages and epochs, and so you don't need to worry about that right now. My point is, is that this stuff is pretty old. We sit way over here right now in this section in the Quaternary, and we are in the Holocene. So a lot of time has passed by since we started making anthracite back in the Paleozoic. When we're talking about fossil fuels, as organisms die, they sink to the bottom of these swamps and oceans. 
After millions of years has passed, the dead organisms are covered with sedimentary rocks, such as sand, clay, silts, whatever it might be, until the weight of the sedimentary rock layer begins to push down on the dead organisms. This is important because the remnants of the biotic matter may become coal, natural gas, and or petroleum, but each form in a very unique way. So in the oceans, you predominantly form natural gas and you form oil, petroleum. But in coal swamps you or swampy conditions, you'll form coal. And it's all because of the way that the material is deposited and buried. And so it's important to recognize that each produce something very different. When we're thinking about fossil fuels, let's start with petroleum and talk about how it is made and where it comes from. So what exactly is petroleum? It's any oily, thick, flammable, usually dark colored liquid that is a mixture of various hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons is the fossil fuel part. These occur naturally in various parts of the world and commonly obtained by drilling subsurface. However, this type of material can ooze up to the surface when you've got fractures in the ground, usually caused by salt domes underground from ancient rock layers that allow oil to seep up to the surface. So oil, diesel, kerosene, gasoline, or all types of petroleum. Oil typically represents the remains of ancient microscopic and I said microscopic, organisms, and specifically marine life, such as foraminifera, that have been altered under high pressure for millions of years. And foraminifera look like tiny little microscopic shells, and inside of them they have a little bit of oil in them that's used for photosynthesis purpose while they're alive. And so when they die, they, they sink to the bottom of the ocean floor, and as literally billions and gazillions of these things accumulate like after a mass extinction event and new layers get put on top of them it kind of squishes that oil out and makes a hydrocarbon layer kind of a cool thing what is coal it's a black or dark brown combustible mineral substance consisting of carbonized vegetables slash plants i think that's the better term for it and it's plant matter that has become a fuel resource. Coal represents the remains of ancient fossilized plants, usually from swamps that have been altered under high pressure over millions of years. And let me qualify that high pressure. That's not always true for coal. The lower the grade of coal, the lower the grade of pressure has been applied to the coal, and that's why it's a lower grade coal. So as the coal ages and more rock layers get put on top of it, it becomes higher pressured and that's important to the quality of the coal. What is natural gas? It's a mixture of both hydrocarbon gases that occurs naturally beneath the Earth's surface, often or near petroleum deposits. And why? Because they really are petroleum deposits. It's just a temperature factor that causes it not to be in a liquid form anymore. Natural gas contains mostly methane, but also includes varying amounts of ethane, propane, butane, and nitrogen, and it's used for fuel and making organic compounds. This natural gas is considered a fossil fuel and is closely related to oil. And let me reemphasize, hydrocarbons have one or two routes they can go. They can stay in a liquid form, and that will produce petroleum products like crude oil, or it can get hot enough to where it vaporizes it and that turns it into natural gas. So natural gas and petroleum oil are one and the same. They came from hydrocarbons. Unlike coal, which did not come from hydrocarbons, it came from dead plants. So let's start with coal and look at the various different characteristics of coal. Most of the coal is located in the northern hemisphere because that's where ancient coal swamps used to exist, especially back during the Carboniferous time uh, section, which is the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian time periods combined in North America and in Europe. That's just the Pennsylvanian, which they call the Carboniferous. TMI, you're like, that's too much information for me. Why does Europe not share the same geologic time scale for the Paleozoic era that Americas do? It's because they had coal swamps for the entire duration. We had a marine setting for the Mississippian, and then we had coal swamps for the Pennsylvanian. 
So what does coal really represent? It represents metamorphosed plants in ancient uh, swamp forest. The current coal consumption rates will likely exhaust the coal reserves and resources in approximately 200 years. That is assuming that we still have more out there and that the consumption rates do not go up. I want you to think about the image you see on the screen and I want you to look at what's in that and that's coal. And as you see trains pass you by from now on, I want you to recognize that many of them are carrying coal. And that depending on where you live, they're likely the coal source may be coming from the Midwest where there is quite a bit of what's called bituminous coal. And that's a little bit higher grade than what we have in Texas. We have a dominance of what's called lignite coal. So you might wonder why we don't ship the good stuff down to these different states that don't have it, like anthracite. Too expensive, but bituminous is plentiful, and we have a whole bunch of it. Coal is obtained through two types of mining. One is called surface mining, and the other is subsurface. So obviously surface is where you, you take the mineral and energy resources that are extracted near the Earth's surface by first removing the topsoil, subsoil, and overlaying rock strata. This is what you're seeing in this picture in the image of your screen. Subsurface actually requires you to drill down underneath the surface and actually start creating tunnels underground to extract the deposits of coal. Coal mining produces one of the greatest sources of water pollution in the world because of the coal refining processes. Coal mining is one of the most dangerous professions. You might have remembered the story of some people in South America, some miners that were trapped for an unprecedented amount of time and survived, which was an unbelievable circumstance. So coal is not environmentally friendly, but there is one type of coal that is the most environmentally friendly, and that is anthracite. So let's talk about extracting coal. Coal beds are found underground in areas that used to be ancient coal swamps. So the key is first to find the areas that are the coal swamps. Then we will actually build a mine and we'll make subsurface shafts if we're doing subsurface, which the old stuff like bituminous and anthracite, you're going to have to likely do that way. And then you'll develop these extensive tunnels and actually uh, cut into and excavate out the coal and bring it back up to the surface. Then you'll take it to a processing plant clean it because you can't burn coal as it is. You have to like crush it up and munch it up to make it, it, it ignitable. It's simply inflammable. So yes, it will catch fire, but not like a piece of charcoal. So understand charcoal is not coal. It is man-made lighter fluid, uh, little charcoal bits is what it is. So as we talk about the variations of coal, I want to point out that the pyramid is important, and that's why all, this is busy slide is kind of all together. So if you look at the thickness of the base of the pyramid where peat is, and you look at the very top of anthracite, notice that each time we go up a step, there's less of the material. And I'm going to tell you, anthracite's the cleanest to burn of all the different coals, and it's the most effective. Peat is the least effective. And then as we go through the ranks, I'm going to talk about how each one is different. And I'm going to tell you that there is an environmental difference between each one of these. So let's start with peat. This is soil matter consisting of partially decomposed organic matter, usually found in swamps and bogs and various parts of temperate zones. Essentially, this is enriched plant material that's dead in mud. And so it's in a transitional stage from being just dead plant growth in mud to compressed plant growth to the formation of coal. So it's becoming kind of from just dead stuff to a coal format. What's lignite? So we've moved from peat up to lignite. It's a soft brownish black coal having more carbon than peat, but less carbon than bituminous coal. Interesting. Lignite is easy to mine, but it does not burn well as compared to the other forms of coal. It requires a little help. It is a great polluter, matter of fact, the worst polluter of the bunch, and then bituminous because it has a higher carbon content than it. 
More importantly, it has volatile organic compounds. It has other types of chemicals that haven't had enough time to burn off. So remember, all coal is carbon. So that's definitely a must to understand. But as it ages, some of the other contaminants will burn off with pressure, making it more effective or better burning units. So if we move up, we go to something called subbituminous. And subbituminous contains less water and is denser than lignite, making it easier to transport, store, and use. It has a lower heating value than bituminous coal, and its sulfur content is often lower than bituminous coal because it is less concentrated. But it's still a high polluter. Bituminous is the next one that we go up to, the most abundant type of coal we have on the planet. It's dark brown to black and relatively high heat value in comparison to lignite. What does that mean? It burns more effectively. Also has a relatively high sulfur content and is a high contributor to acid rain. So I don't want you to get the impression that bituminous is a bad thing. It's much better than burning lignite, and we have a bunch of it. So I'll get to some of the good environmental things in just a minute. What's coking right here? It's a hard, gray, massive, porous fuel. Coke is the solid residue that remains after bituminous coal is heated to a high temperature to remove the impurities. The residue is chiefly carbon with minor amounts of hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. So then we move into the top of the pyramid, the most prized of all coals. And this is the most valuable and rare type of coal, which contains the most carbon. It's very difficult to ignite, but it can be mushed up and burns very well once it does. It burns blue, has the highest BTU capacity, so it means it's very good in heating. And it has a semi-metallic luster, so it is very compressed and shiny. Here we're starting off with peat. And peat is in the ground, and as you see time and pressure, you go from lignite, so here we are at lignite, often referred to, by the way, as dirty coal. And then it will turn into subbituminous right in this section, and then bituminous to right about here, and anthracite all the way at the other end. Anthracite is the most prized of all of the coals. Unfortunately, in Texas, we have predominantly this. But if you go out to the Midwest and other parts of the country, bituminous is very, very common. So where can you find anthracite? A little bit of it's in Kentucky. We have some in some of the Dakotas. But most of it's found in the state of Pennsylvania. When you compare anthracite, bituminous, subbituminous, do you see a difference in how it looks? So you're looking at here's peat, here's lignite, here's subbituminous, bituminous, and then anthracite. So I really take coking out of the equation because coking is a step that humans do. This is the order right here. And so when you kind of stack it up, by the time you meet anthracite from lignite, you can see there's been a dramatic change in the character of that coal. So keep in mind that if I were to burn the same amount of anthracite and the same amount of lignite, let's say a gallon of each, the anthracite would burn substantially longer, would burn cleaner, and it would also produce like just a small amount of waste product at the bottom, just an inch or two. So if we did the same amount of lignite for the same duration, it wouldn't burn nearly as hot for as long, and it would produce almost the same volume of waste that it did uh, of the coal that you started with. And it releases a whole bunch of air pollution. So it's a struggle. How do you deal with that? We have to put some environmental controls in. Coal is fed into a furnace where it heats water into a vapor and spins a generator. Energy is almost always created by spinning something, and that's how a coal fire plant works. So this is your supply of coal, which is usually brought in by rail car. Then it's put into a stack, and here's where the magic happens up here to clean coal. Uh, scrubbers, air scrubbers, are put in to help remove some of the uh, materials that are bad for the atmosphere. One piece of coal acting as a primary energy resource produces 100 energy units. Pretty interesting, huh? An average coal power plant loses 70 units to heat. Electrical transmission lines lose six more units. The incandescent light bulb loses 23 more units to heat. 
one unit is actually converted into visible light. So the end use efficiency of coal is actually pretty good, and that's one reason that we use it. So what is clean coal, and why do people say that coal can be clean? Clean coal fire plants use objects called air scrubbers that I mentioned earlier to catch carbon particles before they enter the atmosphere. Well, they're not just catching carbon particles, they're also trying to capture sulfur dioxide, volatile organic compounds, other types of gases that can be released, methane, things of that nature that are regulated by the federal government in terms of the amount of air pollution that can be released from that coal fire plant. The scrubbers are run through water and the carbon is gathered or other air pollutants. And once the carbon is collected, it's then removed off site and often put inside the remnants of old mine shafts. So clean coal, I guess you can say it can be clean. If we didn't have the scrubbers, it wouldn't be. So in essence, this is what clean coal looks like as it's going through its process. The scrubber is the key. And as technology advances, scrubbers get better at what they're doing. There used to be something called grandfathered status where very old coal-fired plants that were in existence before 1971 and hadn't many, made any changes to their operations could operate as they were. In other words, they were polluting big time. That has since changed and they've had to come into compliance with the Clean Air Act needs to be for everybody, all types of industry, including coal-fired plants. So if you had to ask me a question, Elaine, do you feel that an old fire plant is safer or better than a new one? I'd have to say, heck no. I would tell you that the new one's what I would vote for because it has the new technology. So newer is better. What are the pros for coal? And then we'll look at the cons. Coal is cheap, and that's one reason we use it. Our industry and economy is already adapted to using coal. It's a part of our culture all over the world. Several hundred years of coal likely remain in our reserves. It's very plentiful in North America and clean coal developments have improved our air pollution problems with coal. I'm not saying they've solved it, but they've improved it. So what are the cons? Coal pollution occurs when it is burned, so no two ways about it. If you burn coal, there's going to be some pollution. Our industry and economy are primarily adapted to using it, so what if we run out? Or what if something goes haywire and most of the coal reserves are out of North America and we can't get to what coal reserves exist? Problematic for us. Current usage rates are higher than previously estimated, which means we may run out of it sooner. Clean coal merely shuffles the pollution back in the ground and can contribute to pre-existing water quality and water pollution problems. Food for thought. So let's look at oil. Oil and petroleum provide 60% of the world's energy and 63% of the United States energy resources. Crude oil rises to the top of its entrapped layer. I mentioned a salt dome earlier, and I was referring to this thing right here. So what happens is a salt dome is an, an area that has accumulated a lot of salt, and it will push up. And for those of you who've had a geology class, you might remember that we could have talked about anticlines and synclines. If you've not had a geology course or an earth science course, then this is uh, something new to you. And by the way, anticlines are my favorite thing, so they look like arches. But what happens is the cracks and fractures uh, start allowing the oil to migrate up to the surface. So what we do is put oil rig here and try to follow those cracks or faults down to where the oil is trapped. And then we bring it up to the surface. Most often oil is extracted by drilling a hole into the ground and placing a steel casing around the hole to keep the hole intact. So you might have seen these things out in West Texas or other locations where they're just simple oil rigs. Oil then passed from the ground into the pipe like soda straw. Flow is then controlled by the mechanisms placed on top of the well to control the speed and the amount of barrels collected per day. So some oil rigs produce quite a bit of oil and some do not. Hopefully if you have oil rights, then mineral rights, then you are producing good oil on your property. Another busy slide, but one that's important to kind of keep all together. What are the variations of oil? So let's talk about oil and let's look at your diagram first. The 
lowest boiling point is at the top and the highest boiling point is at the bottom and this diagram and it shows you the various different gases from gasoline to aviation fuel so forth all the way down to asphalt so I'd like to kind of go through all of them starting with gasoline so gasoline is a volatile mixture of flammable liquid hydrocarbons remember that term from earlier hydrocarbons is ancient microscopic life for the most part and it's chiefly derived from crude petroleum and used primarily as a fuel for internal combustion engines an example might be vehicles. Aviation fuel. It's a higher quality fuel than gasoline. Often contains additives to keep it from freezing at high altitudes. That's important also for uh, de-icing of airplanes as a sidebar because that can even happen at ground level. So aviation fuel has to have some differences simply because of that factor. So what's kerosene? So now we've moved to this portion right here of kerosene. It's a mixture of liquid hydro hydrocarbons that are obtained by distilling petroleum. That distilling is the key part. Uh, bituminous shale or like any widely used as a fuel, cleaning solvent, etc. So let's move to heating oil. That's going to be this one down here. Used mainly in cooler areas of the world and it's a thin form of oil used to fuel boilers and heaters and larger structures. Very common. In many hospitals, for example, they'll have some kind of heating oil as a backup for energy resource should uh, electricity or something fail for the hospital so they have a backup supply. So what's diesel oil? Let's get to this one right here contains a higher density of uh, material than gasoline by nearly 18 percent and it's refined in a process very similar to heating oil produces high levels of sulfur and more power than gasoline that high level of sulfur means it also pollutes more and uh, that's one of the reasons that emission controls are placed on our vehicles going to lubricants right here so remember we're increasing in our uh, boiling capacity Commonly an oil-based product designed to prevent friction and contains 90% petroleum and about 10% additive minerals. And then if we make it to asphalt, this is the crudest of all forms, extremely viscous, meaning thick, used to keep rocks and other minerals together, commonly used as roadway materials. All of these are variations of oil, but they all stem from hydrocarbons. So understand that there are different variations of it. Typically we've done something to it to make it what it is. You don't just get gas that comes up to the surface that you put in your car. Additives are put into it like benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, known as BTEX and MTBE. So it will burn cleaner and more efficient. So each one of these have additives that we've added to make it work as a type of oil. So the anatomy of a traditional oil plant basically has a place to store the oil, a place for the compression, for the combustion chambers, an exhaust system, which you'd likely have scrubbers there, generators, and a transformer to create a power source. When you compare oil and coal, the coal fire plant is actually burning something where we have the combustion kind of enclosed in this section right here. But at the end of the day, they both can create air pollution. That's why there are air standards in place by the Clean Air Act. So what's the pros of oil? Large amounts of it are available, or at least sort of available. We've been using a lot of the excess, uh, the ones that are in large quantities like I showed you in the anticline. We've pretty much been extracting those for over a hundred years or more. But now we're having to really look at shale layers that contain oil between the tiny little particles of shale that makes it very t difficult to get out the shale or the oil from the shale. So that's called fracking. That's our next lesson, by the way. Moderate supply of petroleum reserves in North America. Our transportation system is already adapted to oil and it's relatively inexpensive to extract, or is it? Uh, the infrastructure can be very expensive. So I guarantee you, my sister works at an oil and gas company. She's an attorney for them. They're not going to put a rig somewhere they haven't done the homework and are pretty darn sure that that rig's going to generate what it costs to put oil or get oil out of the ground. They're just not going to do that. So what are the cons? Most of the available quantities are located out of the United States. Our transportation system is 
based around petroleum and its availability. So if that were to become an issue, which I might point out several wars have been fought over oil reserves, thinking of the Gulf War. You can even think about earlier wars. This is a big deal. It's a worldwide issue of who controls fossil fuels. Humans must begin exploring dangerous locations around the world to discover new sites that contain oil. And the average oil costs are rising as other nations develop their industry and the burning of petroleum caused air emissions, acid rain, and water pollution, of which the last is the most concerning to me. So let's look at natural gas. Let's talk about what natural gas is. Methane is a colorless, odorless, flammable gas, and it's the main constituent of marsh gas, meaning swamp gas, and also a poison of gases of coal mines. So something to think about also that comes from landfills. CH4 is what methane is, and it's commercially obtained from natural gas. And it's the first member of the methane and a series of hydrocarbons. So here's your carbon and then your hydrocarbons. In most cases, it's initially is created the same way as oil, but it turns into a vapor at temperatures exceeding 100 degrees Celsius. Methane is the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. So as bacteria break down something as it dies, then you get leftover gas. So let's think about a landfill as food rots and decays. It's going to have bacteria that helps it do that. Well, when that happens, it uh, releases a gas. So natural gas is only considered natural gas if the methane levels exceed roughly 90%. Some refineries prefer 97% methane instead of 90%. It's used in oil refineries concurrent with oil, and it can also contribute to the depletion of the ozone layer because methane holds about 10 times more heat per molecule than carbon dioxide, which means it's good if you got a lot of it in the atmosphere, it's going to cause a warming uh, trend in the atmosphere. So where is natural gas extraction occur. You can kind of look across the world and see that we have a lot of it. And uh, every continent has some, but you can see some have more than others. So you have to ask yourself why. And it all boils down to ancient conditions that were perfect for forming hydrocarbons. So if you're looking at our continent at North America, then you're going to notice that the whole thing's covered with it, right? So that means that we've had our continent covered by oceans multiple times. So I'd say the same thing is true of South America, most of Eurasia, all of Australia. Africa, not so much so. So uh, certainly this section of it right in here, the Middle East. But it's all about the perfect conditions geologically. And if, if you don't learn anything from this lesson, I hope that you take that as a takeaway, that each one of these types of fossil fuels has to have the perfect geologic conditions in which to form. So another way that we can get natural gas out of the ground is hydraulic fracturing, known as fracking. When natural gas is saturated inside porous rocks, miners drill into the rock filled with natural gas and create a series of small explosions, earthquakes, to break up the rock. Once the rock is broken up, the drillers fill up the rock with pressurized water to force up the natural gas. They typically inject some other types of chemicals to kind of pry open uh, the rock and then they suck it out, almost like a straw. So along the fault zones, the natural gas can contaminate groundwater if there is a groundwater supply nearby, and natural gas miners are not required by federal law to comply with the Clean Water Act, at least not at this time. So that is a scary thought more to come on that. Current world consumption of natural gas is 97 trillion cubic feet per year. It's astonishing. The current rate is estimated to be no longer than 65 years. Folks, we're Basically, you're going to be making natural gas in real time. 75% of all known natural gas reserves are located in Asia Minor, Russia, and southern southeastern Asia. North American countries consume about 30% of all global natural gas. So let's take a look at natural gas extraction. <laughs> so if you're getting a last out of this, you have to understand that cows are often blamed for the methane problem we have on the planet. Well, they're just one piece of the equation. Methane is released during digestion. Well, you probably experienced the same thing. 
Animals digest energy in their bodies and secrete enzymes that cause food to decay quickly, specifically bacteria enzymes. These enzymes cause methane to detach and release gas. You get my drift, right? Literally, haha. <laughs> anyway, the odor of the waste is not methane, but the rapid decay of food. So you, you know what I'm talking about. We've all been there, right? High fiber equals more methane. So the more of that healthy stuff you take in, the more comes out the backside. Each round of natural gas is commonly containing between 2% to 5% methane. So why are we picking on the cows? Well, one or two cows by themselves, not such a big deal, but when you have 10,000 of them in close proximity, such as a concentrated animal feeding operation known as a CAFO, a feedlot can generate a tremendous amount of methane. But let's not just point the fingers at the cows. Let's also look at landfills. Let's also think about permafrost that's melting, because permafrost is a huge source of dead, decaying plant material that can certainly produce methane as it decays. Methane is released when foods rot, bacteria breaks them down. Well, it does it in the same way in the landfill, right? Landfills and sewers release methane uh, emissions, and sp specific landfills trap methane and use it as renewable energy and actually sell it back to the grid. That's a good thing. Unorthodox sources of methane. Methane can be extracted from fecal matter, but it must be cooked at a certain temperature for a specific amount of time. What a great job, huh? The organic waste can then be refined and rerouted back to the cooker to increase methane content and concentration. This is an example of that kind of contraction. Well, this is actually done at some wastewater uh, treatment plants as well. So when you harvest that methane, you basically want to pull it out of the ground bring it up to a collection station through collection pipes, and then uh, convert it into, you usually have to clean it, and then move it into the electrical grid. And what I mean by clean it, you'd probably run it through like a scrubber type system in order to remove some of the impurities. What are the pros? Natural gas is cleaner to burn than other fossil fuels, and it's considered a renewable energy resource because we keep on generating it with every food we eat, with every... Mmm, cow we make and every time we feed them and everything we put in the landfill, you get my drift. Amazing amounts of this natural gas exist in North America and it's seen as a viable alternative to oil and coal. What are the cons? It's still a greenhouse gas, it still pollutes. In the technical sense, natural gas is not a renewable energy resource, but we are creating it in real time. Fracking is a very dangerous business often linked to polluting groundwater, as well as other issues that are associated with it. Well, we'll have a whole lesson on that if you're uh, staying tuned for it. So be ready for fracking because it's kind of an interesting topic. Moving into some science servings. Coal is one of the few substances able to heat a fire long enough to me melt metals. So it's often used in foundries, if you didn't know that. The U.S. consumes about 21 million barrels of oil every day, and that number continues to climb as our population grows in the United States and more vehicles and need for oil increases. The term petroleum was first used in 1546, and it was applied by this guy that just really, I don't know where he came up with it. What was he thinking? Why petroleum? I, I just don't know. Who knows? But anyway, he, he came up with it, Agricola did, and it's been with us ever since. Coal is the primary energy source in both China and the United States, and it was used during the Bronze Age in Britain to melt metal. So they've been using it, meaning they, humans, us, for a very long time. And coal is the official state rock of Utah. I think that's pretty cool. Coal is the official mineral of Kentucky. Should be, because they got some anthracite there. So Titan's atmosphere is filled with water and methane molecules, and that happens to be important because it's a moon. And uh, these include other hydrocarbons that are broken methane molecules. You're wondering, how did it get methane? Well, whole nother story about why the gaseous planets got the gas and lots of methane back in the very early origins of our solar system. So because it's not formed the same way our methane was formed uh, here on Earth. 
Titan has thunderstorms to create methane rain, and Titan has viscous rivers and lakes of methane. Kind of cool. Titan is estimated to have 100 times about the natural gas as Earth. Just imagine if we could build a pipeline to Titan all the way to planet Earth. We might have something to think about. So as you think about this and consult about oil, gas, and coal, understand that there are issues with it. We rely on it. That's a fact. But one day, we may have to look for alternative sources, and that's where the beauty of renewable energy comes into play. So I hope you'll join me as we look at fracking, uh, because fracking is a specific issue related to natural gas, and I want you to have more information on that. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Bye.